trying to develop a STEM network where we're all working together for the South Suburban area so that we're not working in isolation. When we came in, we saw people who were actually working in scientific professions coming together. This is kind of like a, a hub, a place where you know, we can all kind of gravitate towards as a, a STEM home base. I just really want to learn more about the Science Museum and just collaborate and share ideas. The resources in terms of what's available uh, through this type of opportunity are phenomenal, especially since it's right in our backyard. It seems like there's a lot of like-minded individuals here that are all trying to get to the same goal. I'm going to tell a story, a kind of a slice of my life, that involves growing up in Indianapolis. David Letterman was just a few years ahead of me. Uh, my brother dated his sister, oh. <laughs> Gretchen Letterman. Um, I grew up in Indianapolis. And uh, my mom was a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, even a second grade teacher for 19 years in the Indianapolis public schools. My dad was a scientist studying neurotransmission in the brain and discovered a new neurotransmitter in, in the spinal cord. So I uh, had kind of an interesting childhood of, of learning about how to learn being exposed to cutting-edge science and and I would visit my dad's lab and of course I tinkered and and in a way did pop-up science you know at my house and I had a lab in the basement and I began to think about how to get myself more interested in science and how to get everybody interested in science and then I would uh, meet my parents, friends, sometimes other teachers. We would travel to Milwaukee and stop in Chicago, and I would visit MSI in the Field Museum and began to feel this impact of immersive environments. I remember the Foucault pendulum and my dad explaining the Foucault pendulum and, and noticing there weren't really any good explanations around the Foucault pendulum. <laughs> And currently, there, there aren't any right now at MSI. There is, there's some overview, um, but it needs to be enhanced. I remember the coal mine. I remember the submarine, et cetera. Um, I remembered my mom teaching and, and hearing her stories. And I grew up in Indianapolis building uh, shortwave radios, doing Heath, Heath kits, thinking again about education and how to get engrossed in science, because I liked it. I, th I thought it could be a neat career. I also was a painter, an artist, and I would draw. And uh, I would uh, put up pictures. I would think of ways to visualize information. So today, I'd like to talk about my background a bit more and my thinking about science education. I'd like to ask how many science teachers or how many teachers are in the audience right now? Wow, a lot. What I say, you can disagree. In fact, you can stop me. But it's my perspective. It's, it's just my kind of filter of things. And we could have a debate. But I, this, this is to be informal. I'm going to take a slice of the content. I'm going to focus in on DNA, because it, it's top of mind. I created interactive exhibits about a lot of different subjects. The commonality was the stuff was invisible. It was very abstract ideas that are tough to understand. So I created, my first project was an imaging exhibit, 7,000 square feet with NSF support, where you could immerse yourself in a network that basically had this kind of technology that we all use today in 1993. And so Apple visited this exhibit. There were other technologists. There was a lot of interest in imaging. And then we created an exhibit about NetWorld where you could go inside the internet and understand bitification. You could understand what packet switching was about. I'm not going to focus on that. I'd like to focus on the biological sciences. I work at the Museum of Science and Industry. I'm in Hyde Park. I know some of you here at the University of Chicago. That little spot up there on Google Maps is the Knapp Center for Biomedical Discovery. 
You notice it's nearby the Washington Park. And if you go east is Jackson Park. This is where the Obama Center is going to be in the next couple of years. It's going to be a lot of activity, over a half a billion, probably clo close to a quarter billion dollars going into this area. And certainly the famous MSI Museum of Science and Industry. And I continue to collaborate with MSI. I collaborate with teachers. Some of you are here today. And think about how to create great experiences to learn, both in informal and informal environments. Where I work, we're always thinking about genomics. We're thinking about the A, C, G, and T, the nucleotides, the three billion bases that are in every cell of your body. And practically every week, we're looking at large databases of patients. And, and medicine is rapidly changing. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but uh, all that kind of data is quickly flowing into devices like this. And we're beginning to use this information to help with new kinds of therapeutics or certainly new kinds of diagnostics. All this technology is being developed and we're, we're developing these ideas. And all this, again, is about these A, C, Gs, and Ts and the variation in those nucleotides. They're called mutations. And this is taught sometimes pretty early in junior high. I, I, I think maybe even fifth or sixth grade, but certainly in high school, you'll learn about DNA, you'll learn about genes, you'll learn about these A, C, Gs, and Ts. And what we're discovering is all this information that's being expressed in all your cells is being organized into networks. This is called systems biology. And we're begin, beginning, beginning to be able to model how all this information expressed from genes and expressed from non-coding areas of the genome are talking to each other and regulating everything to work so you're alive and feeling good. We're also looking at this in cancers and other kinds of disease states. This is where medicine is moving. We're beginning to model this, and it impacts you. It impacts all living things. All this relates to the core curriculum that you learn in junior high and high school and biology. And I think about this all the time, again, because you know I grew up with a mom who was teaching this. And I think about how to make this easy to understand and fun and interactive. But I also notice when I visit schools, and sometimes I help co-teach, and sometimes we bring in new lessons, that there are things, there are challenges. And this is perhaps where we could disagree or agree, that teachers are under a lot of pressure to focus in on core curriculum related to standards. But it sure would be nice to do something cool, like at MSI, but in your classroom. And who has time to do something like that? So sort of the end goal, what I'm thinking about, is science centers, museums, and certainly universities could help. Because teachers don't have time to organize all this. They're under a lot of pressure. The students have to pass the test. There are all these challenges. There are the obvious achievement measures and achievement gaps. I'm co-chair of the diversity committee at, at the University of Chicago. We, we think about the pipeline. I've been part of admissions committees, and I, I wonder, well, why didn't the student continue to progress and didn't pass these certain courses? Because if you don't pass genetics, you're not moving ahead in science. We review all the grades. We look at all the curriculum that you took. What are the problems? We also understand the urban stress. There are people at the University of Chicago and elsewhere studying stress. And, and I will talk about stress because stress and, and how we cope with stress is important with this story that I'm going to tell. I also think about how pedagogy, how the art of science could be enriched if, if universities and colleges and science centers could bring great stories to life and curriculum. We could help teachers bring it to life. This was just recently in the news, a scientist at the University of Chicago looking at 
uh, molecular networks that are regulating thin formation and hand formation. They're commonalities. They're common circuits that are being used to produce these. And, and so, you know, of course, I think about well, what inspired me? How did I get so interested? Yeah, my mom was a teacher, and uh, this is dating me, and my dad was a scientist, and, and I was a, a nerd. I mean, you know. Uh, I, these are the kinds of books I read, and, and I love Mathematica. Just amazing, amazing exhibit. If you're ever in Boston, go see it. Classic, classic exhibit. Um, I, uh, Gilbert uh, chemistry sets. You can't, you know, you can't buy some watered down versions of this. And then I think about, well, what could be, what's going on now to inspire and, and uh, uh, to get you interested in science? And, and there are obvious things. I mean, great teachers, parents, science, scientists, what, what happens at this center and elsewhere. These, these are kind of the, the laundry list of things. Neil Shubin's uh, book and, and programs online. But the reality is, the way schools, the way formal education is, is just like what's going on right now. I mean, you go into a classroom and you sit down and you listen. And some people take notes. Some are using technology. Some folks are, are surfing the web. I mean, they're, they're kind of listening, but, you know, maybe they're absorbing. Uh, but the lectures will be online, maybe. Um, I don't know. And people are, I don't know if you're familiar with Flickr technology. So you can, you can kind of midway pause and then get quick feedback. And that's kind of interesting. That's, that's going on to try to make it go beyond just sitting there with people, with all, you know your students, your, everybody grew up with this kind of technology and with Pixar movies and Steven Spielberg, I mean, and then you come and sit and just listen. I mean, it's, it's got to be great. And some of the teachers here do that. I mean, I, I get exhausted watching them do it. But this is the reality. And let's just pick a subject. I'm going to pick one subject, the DNA and genes, something top of mind. And this is the stuff you got to know cold. If you don't understand this, frankly, in high school, right, Elizabeth? You're not going to pass that exam. I know some students, and teachers can confirm this, I think some students get lost where they are. And, and there are things with interactivity and visualizations we could help students know precisely where they are because they'd never get lost using Google Maps, <laughs> right? You could use, there could be a Google, and, and how do I know that? Because I work with software people or have to create a way to take a trip inside the genome. We created that in the genetics exhibit. The Exploratorium created this image, which is kind of cool. You kind of introduce, where, where is the DNA? Oh, it's in a cell. And you, deep, and you dive down. And when I go to classrooms and ask some quick questions, I get answers back that mix up chromosomes and DNA, A, C, Gs, and Ts, and then they're telling me something about chromosomes because they're memorizing, because I gotta quickly get this straight to take the test. But if, if it could become clearer, these are things I think about. All right, bear with me. This a little technical changes, the A, C, Gs, and Ts, when they change, those, those are mutations, mutations. Genetic variation, they could be called SNPs. So if one A comes to T, SNP, there's a little variation. There could be insertions and deletions. Believe it or not, we, we find chunks of DNA missing. By the way, all of us are walking around with about 80 to 100 SNPs that are different from everybody else. And you're doing fine, <laughs> right? You're doing fine. There are transposable elements that ho hop around. The, the uh, classic story about the peppered moth, the industrial melanism story, that's due to a transposable element that jumped into a gene that has something to do with coloration of the moths. Chromosome rearrangements, we, we're discovering that all the time.
This was just published. This is news. This was in Nature last week. Again, the top is a chunk of the chromosome area which is encoding information to make proteins. And you start with individual one at the top and you go to 60,000. You can go 60,000 people. And what has just been uh, published is we've uncovered practically every genetic variation that exists in humans. Wow. Every one. Every one. Over 7.4 million have been discovered. More than half are only seen once. We're all walking around with unique A, C, Gs, and Ts arranged. Now, why would why is that of interest? I mean, this is the part of the, of the genome, which is only about 1.5% of our genome, that makes proteins we need. And if the amino acids change, that could be a problem. Or if it truncates, if the protein stops midway, that could be a problem. This is changing medicine right now. This is dramatically changing, and over the next 5 to 10 years, the fact is, if we learn this and remember it, we'll be able to interact, we'll be able to discuss this with our doctors, we'll understand this well, but I'll, I'll point out something. That this is taught in high schools about DNA genes. It's taught in genetic courses. If you don't understand this, if you don't pass, boom, STEM development, you're not you're not going to advance. You're not going to get a PhD eventually. You're not going to major, uh, uh, get a master's degree. This is key material that you need to understand, a key idea. And there are people who study this. Why, why is it so hard to understand A, C, Gs, and Ts? And this is a paper that was published. They studied undergraduates at the University of Colorado before they took the course and learned about A, C, Gs, and Ts, and after they took the course. And they asked the simple question, on the left are areas, or content areas of the genetics course, and this is one of the questions. Now I'll just read it out loud and you can think about it. Suppose that a single DNA base change of an A to T occurs and is copied during replication is this change necessarily a mutation? Think about it. It's a test question. University of Colorado produced it. Professors of education and some of the scientists advised them on these questions. We're trying to figure out why is this so hard to understand and answer questions like this. Why is this tripping up people? And I won't embarrass anybody. I could do a quick poll and see. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. OK, you're thinking about it? OK. These are these tough, tricky questions that students have trouble with in college and even in high school. The question about the mutation is question number four. And the uh, first bar. Question number four, Olive, look, it's less than 50% before they took the course got that question correct. And I'm surprised it's that many. Maybe, well, maybe they remembered what they'd learned in high school. And yours Colorado students are pretty sharp, too. Then they took the course, and around 70% got it right, but 30% still got it wrong. What's the correct answer? Again, I'm not going to embarrass people. OK, so let's go back. So the, the answer is A. Any change, right? Any change is a mutation. Right. He got it right. All right, so we go back. And look, you, you know, OK, all, you know, the students, some didn't get it right. But all, the ones who didn't get it right said D. Well, what is that D? You go back. Well, D is, yeah, if the base change occurs in the coding part of the gene and alters the amino acid sequence of a protein, otherwise, no. So there's a misconception about this definition that it has to be specific to disrupt a protein or have some kind of protein effect. No, mutation, and this, 
you know, this could just be, well, it's a stupid question. It's ambiguous. It's poorly written. And, and we could discuss that. But maybe it's just because non-majors don't understand that. But they looked at majors and non-majors, and everybody's having problems with this question. Maybe, maybe it should be rewritten to be clearer. So, uh, Elizabeth, I went to your, your course, your class, and I went to uh, a few other places, Collegiate Scholars, um, and these are the high school students who have some knowledge about biology, and basically they're doing the same thing. So people are having, it's a challenge. This is a critical area of biology to learn. And again, people are studying this and trying to understand why is it hard to do well, especially in pipeline, so-called pipeline courses, or sometimes you're called gatekeeping courses. If you don't pass, if you don't take, do well in that biology course, if you get a C, that's it. C, D, E, F, you're out. And we want to keep people in, we want you to get A's and B's. We want you to do well. So when we get your, at the University of Chicago, we get your application, we're going we're gonna to accept you. So studies have shown, this isn't a flip classroom, but you can, you can take students in a more active way to practice answering these kinds of tricky questions. And my mom would say, well, duh, they do better. And this gets published in Science. And there are other papers like this. And, and again, I talked to my mom about this. And she goes, God, I learned this in 1949. <laughs> I mean, I, you know. Um, I think these are things that we could do to improve STEM education and pop-up science and exhibits and curriculum to be thoughtful about how we ask these questions, how we assess, but how we present it too. How do, how do we make this really interesting, engaging? And, and I think practice is good, but what else is missing? Well, I'm biased. I, you know, I think about, uh, because I'm a scientist and I think about what's being published, there's interesting work going on in cognitive science, like this active classroom thing and, and uh, with, with uh, um, ways to interact with the teacher. They're now even called flip classrooms. And flip classrooms are, well, you just go online and watch the video of the lecture, and then you're basically you're just trying to answer questions like this. And, pe and they find they do better. Um, these are some folks that are really trying to carefully kind of pick out approaches to learn science. And I think this helps us think about approaches for science centers and exhibits. And there's interesting data. This is being published in, in prestigious journals. Carl Wyman, Nobel Prize winner, he discovered as he's lecturing, if he just stops his lecture about a vibrating uh, violin string and just interacts with the students, uh, they do better on tests. So pause, interact with students, and teach, some teachers do this already. Kids are under enormous stress. We're all under stress. And one of the world's experts, Sion Bellick, is studying this. And, it, and has discovered, and others have discovered, if in integrated into the curriculum, into the school, there are ways to kind of cope with that stress. It helps with academic achievement. Sam Silverstein, this Columbia University, discovered if teachers have opportunities to do research in the summer and then go back, their kids do better. It's not too surprising. So I, I watch all this and I think about it and I think about how to design curriculum and lessons and how to work with colleagues, educators and colleagues. Um, and some people think, well, it could be instructor centered where you, know, you pick a textbook or you could, and, and develop your course that way or your exhibit that way, or you could backward design. What, what's the core concept you wanna know? Let's nail A, C, Gs and Ts. You will never get this thing wrong. You will understand DNA, and I guarantee none of you are going to forget this. You will never get this question wrong after you're done with this. What a mutation is, is one of those ACGs and Ts changes. It's a mutation. 
I think it could be made more compelling if we demonstrated that, if we made it come alive right before your eyes and made it interactive and did an experiment. Do something really cool. So I'm going to back up a second and just say, this is where I came from. And this is what's influencing me right now. Because uh, I finished my postdoctoral research studying gene regulation. And I was invited to come to MSI and think about how one and a half to two million people a year could learn about science. And uh, Jack Kahn, who was the president and CEO, said, well, Barry, what do you want to do first? And I said, well, I want to focus on A, C, Gs, and Ts. I want to nail DNA. And, and I got the opportunity at MSI to do that. And I would always get projects that are on your right. I would get projects about abstract things. And frankly, I didn't mind because I wanted to focus on DNA. This was stuff that was invisible, wasn't tangible, who cares? But everybody cares about the coal mine, <laughs> right? And we were moving that submarine. That was pretty incredible. That was amazing. And the 727 jet, and we moved the column, and we hoisted that up, and we were making a new Santa Fe railroad. We made a new railroad. That was all cool. Um, and, and we enriched it with some material science and ideas. But I got this stuff. And uh, it was abstract. And Jack Kahn said, OK, Barry, you have half a year or three quarters of a year. What are you going to do? And the previous year, it was about superconductivity. And we were levitating things, the Meissner effect. And uh, I said, well, well we're going to do DNA. They're going to learn A, C, Gs, and Ts. And um, I began to sketch out ideas. So I, I, I like to sketch out ideas, my artists. And I thought, well, why don't we just make it come alive? Let's make a space with A, C, Gs, and Ts. It's right in front of you. And uh, we continue to develop this idea. Let's make it a, a, a theater production for summer. So 200,000 people will learn A, C, Gs, and Ts and nail mutations. And we rendered this. This is before everybody had CAD. So, so we art directed this. And uh, yeah, we did little models and, you know, and, and then we did it. We discovered, I hired a composer and we discovered a melody, a, a, a set of tones inside the insulin gene. And over the summer we played genetic songs and you could hear subtle differences in ACGTs when we compared human insulin with dog insulin. There's slight variations. And people loved it. It nailed A, C, Gs, and Ts. We used music. We used images. We had a story. We, we used analogies and metaphors. We had somebody up there saying, blah, 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 and, and talked about it. And we played the music. And I had, uh, we had letters from attorneys, uh, teachers, very intrigued with this idea. Uh, and this was a prototype. This was a concept. And then it went away. It went away. Uh, this was my introduction. The president liked this, and so he said, you could stay. You know, <laughs> you could. I did all right. And in, some of you might remember the sickle cell exhibit that was there for many years. Interesting exhibit. It had a rotating globe and molecule, all those amino acids, and it had a gel electrophoresis backlit thing, and then it had this abstract thing. Does anybody know what this is? I mean, this is like lifted out of your old textbook, your biology textbook. And the idea was these were generation by generation. You were going to study transmission of the sickle gene. And we had old-fashioned phones. And you would listen to the guy talk. And now we'll look at something's glowing. It was, it was a, a great attempt. But most people, including some of my colleagues in science, couldn't figure this exhibit out. Um, so we studied this. It was an interesting idea, and it had some interesting art. And then um, I did get some money to create an interactive where you 
role play being a genetic counselor. You have African American couples that are interested in finding more information about the potential to have a sickle gene in their family. And we worked with the African American churches, African American community, and we developed a prototype app to learn about, again, the A, C, Gs, and Ts. It's a mutation in a globin molecule. And when it does have that change, globins become stickier and can cause the sickle structure, you get a phenotype, et cetera, et cetera. We created interactive and we did some data analysis. And normally with, with exhibits, people, yeah, they come over and pick up a phone, push a button, move on. Maybe if they stay 10 seconds, that's great. We found people were staying three, four, five, six minutes. People were staying longer with this. Why? Because they were very curious what these African-American couples, what, what was the outcome? There was a story. And you got to virtually analyze blood, and you got to um, learn about this story. And we found the age range, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, young people were very intrigued with this. And that gave more confidence that we could create an interactive, a so-called genetic counselor interactive, that exists today. So this is like version 3.0, and this is in the current genetics exhibit, and one of it is, one aspect of, is it, of it is about sickle cell, and we think it's pretty good. We think it's pretty good. Genetics is, I can't believe it's over 14 years old. Integrated into the genetics exhibit, we think are ways to learn about A, C, Gs, and Ts that are very powerful. The importance of sequences. This is over 5,000 square feet. This budget was over 4 million. And we could hire people, designers. We knew people loved live animals. So if you remember the genetics exhibit, and, and the president would constantly ask me, Barry, why are the chicks? Don't, don't they belong in a farm? They're, they're farm animals. And, and uh, I think he learned something about, well, the development of life is about the expression of genetic information, the environment is important, and you learn about that in this, along with the other animals. We went to Hawaii and got cloned mice. We went to other labs and got genetically engineered animals. We had transgenic organisms. And how did we know all this had potential for people to get excited about genetics? I, can, I was developing these ideas all the time and testing these ideas. And these are ideas that never happen. So one idea was to do a Beanie Baby cross. <laughs> and some kids thought that would be pretty intriguing. We still could do that if we had the budget. Another idea is a gene slide where your butt is like a polymerase. <laughs> and literally, you'll, your butt will go through A, C, Gs, and Ts, and you'll express a gene. <laughs> we didn't do that. And you have your mother's eyes and your father's nose. This doesn't reproduce great. It was a great ad campaign. And then it had a picture of a, a prenatal hand. And we could morph it back. And it begins to kind of look amphibian-like. This is in the news. Again, New York Times. So um, anyway, these are, I love doing these ideas. As this science center is developing ideas, you sketch out. Some of these pop-up ideas resonate. They don't. Form an evaluation. You can put them up on boards. And you could talk to audiences. I know we have a kids advisory group here to give you feedback. And they go, eh, eh, eh. you know. But we knew, everybody said, I got to see those clones. We got the clone mice. We got to do that. And we developed all the interactive. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the exhibit looks pretty good. You can fly through the genome. I was just there a few days ago. After 14 years, we have all these animals. You could practice cloning. 
and Jim Watson visited, and we did a special event. If you could, if you could actually bring, you know, the the live guy who did something or a gal who did something, uh, there he is with me as I'm pointing out uh, all these things, and um, they donated an exact replica of the DNA double helix. This is the structure they built in the early 50s. There it is. It's right up there. This is what was used to model the actual helical structure. It's at MSI. It's a historic model. And we did the survey work and we discovered people do understand how this connects to the development of life, how genes uh, affect us throughout life. We studied where they move through the space, how long do they stay. We discovered some animals people seem to miss. It's kind of weird. Everybody loves the chicks. <laughs> Everybody loves the chicks. And we studied this. So uh, I moved on, and, and I'm at the University of Chicago, and I'm thinking about all these things and thinking about how to work with uh, teachers and schools. And I, I, I thought about an idea <clears throat> that we tested out first at Maine East, and, and that was to make the ideas about DNA and ACGs and Ts tangible and relevant to your life. And the idea was to, and of course, connect to standards. So the teachers here will know what I'm talking about. Next generation science standards were coming out. We wanted to connect to the structure of DNA, determines proteins, etc., <clears throat> hierarchical organization of, of these systems, evidence of feedback, a homeostasis. And I thought, well, we could do that. We could, like I'm designing an exhibit, we could design a lesson. This was the prototype, the first prototype, to bring mutant worms, nematode worms, into the classroom. They just have one A or C, I don't remember which thing, one change. And what happens is they are super, super resistant to, to high salt. You can stress animals with salt. You can osmotically stress animals. These mutants don't care. They don't care about it. In 10 minutes, you can test wild type and, and, and mutant nematodes. The students were doing that. And it was interesting. I watched, so this is like a time lapse here. At the top, the teacher is off to the side. And the instructor, UC instructor, is there. And over about 10 to 15 minutes, the teacher began to move closer and closer and closer. And then she took over. She got it. She understood, this is pretty cool. I could lead this. And, and the UC instructor had to kind of step aside. And the students were all collaborating on an experiment. They were stressing worms and getting data and learning about A, C, Gs, and Ts. And we thought that was pretty cool. And I test, we tested this at another high school. This is von Steuben. We began to think about, well, how do you visualize these core concepts? Osmosis usually is pretty boring. But believe it or not, life has evolved for millions of years ways to cope with osmotic stress. In the soil, salinity changes, this is all current research. We're beginning to discover the genes that regulate this. And osmosis, ideas about diffusion, osmosis all integrate together. And these stress ideas, here are the worms over here that you're testing. I should have brought some today, I'm sorry, <laughs> I forgot. And this kind of coalesced, kind of a core kind of framework that teachers can agree or disagree, or you could point out gaps. But these are, these are things that I began to think about that, that could make this engagement, this active learning, really sing, really, really spectacular. You'll never forget ACGs and Ts. If students become responsible for their learning, and, and it's strategic, it's energized, collaborative, obviously linked to standards. If there's a goal, if you're kind of figuring out, you, you know you got to get to some end point, and there's a story, and, and you can tell this story, and with images that make sense, I know where I am, I'm not lost. It's authentic, connected to the real world. This is cutting edge research. This framework, we began to fold into additional testing in schools. 
This is at Kenwood Academy just very recently where, where we brought in uh, the nematode worms and stressed them. And the students are, you know, it's typical when, when you bring out all these microscopes, you're wasting all this time. I mean, frankly, it takes 10, 20, 30 minutes to get all these scopes, get all this stuff together. And the end goal, you want to uh, observe live organisms and do a little quick test and do a little experiment, learn about them. And here's where the museum stuff comes to mind. I think about the Museum of Science and Industry, and here are the worms. We have the worms here, and here's this design that costs millions and millions of dollars. But is there a way to take a slice of these exhibits and actually make it available into the classroom, go beyond just bringing cultures, but bring a portable interactive exhibit into the classroom and test that idea out? And why not use technology that's digital, that's wireless, and so that, and I've noticed another thing, and teachers can correct me if I'm wrong, that practically, well, a lot of students already have technology in their pockets in school. So they have their iPhones and Androids. What would happen if everybody immediately got images that are being generated from this experiment and they're collaborating and they have different interactives that they're using with their technology and they can report back peer to peer, they could continue to uh, develop this idea. And if you could touch, if you could interact tangible molecules of salt and water, you could feel osmosis, we're developing some ideas about that. And if you could actually have that gene that's mutated, and we still don't understand why one nucleotide change results in this phenotype, we think it has something to do with glycerol. So organisms will regulate the osmo kind of flux by creating molecules, osmolites. We think it has something to do with glycerol, but every summer we have high school students come and do this, and, and it's, it's an open question. We still don't, we still don't know. This is, this is an idea that I have. And it, it kind of segues into the idea that life, we thought life was complicated, but it really, really is complicated. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's, it's about networks. It's about interacting components over time and space. And you can visualize these networks. This particular network is the putative network that regulates stress resistance in worms. And I teach an undergraduate course, and uh, we just read a paper about how in yeast, this kind of network that helps yeast stand, withstand stress, osmotic stress, talks to a network, and by talk I mean it, it's sending information, to a network about cell proliferation. So networks are talking. I mean, it's, it's like the internet. And if you as an artist and designer, if you look at these networks, they're scale-free. They, like ne they are like the internet. They have hubs, and they're robust, and it goes way beyond the A's, C's, G's, and T's.